it really started off like most young people when they really want to do something your parents tell you no you can't this is my friend my friend Irene I was born in Lucerne, in central Switzerland. And I was brought up here in a traditional Jewish family. My father was extremely suspicious of the art school in Lucerne. Of course, that's all I wanted to do was go to the Kunstschule. And I also was friendly with the main teacher who was a communist, this already didn't work well, terrible. So my mother managed to negotiate that I was allowed to do a correspondence course in commercial art. That was a compromise to start with. Um, so I was allowed to go to London, where I also studied graphics at the Polytechnic. But then I fell in love as a Muslim. In England, I was immediately somehow able to take part in a quite a prestigious exhibition. My first exhibition experience was actually at the Royal Society of Arts. And, uh, and my parents were very surprised because after all I didn't go to art school, how come she gets to exhibit in this thing? After a year I had to come back. And I thought, where could I come back to? A, I wanted to get as far as possible from Lutzen because I wasn't that happy in Lutzen. So I looked on the map and Geneva was the furthest. So in Geneva, I actually continued with graphic art, but for my living, I was quite lucky. I had um, a diploma in commercial skills, so I was able to be, work as a temporary, you know, as a secretary. In the time in between, I was able to, um, to work as a graphic artist. And there, there were other foreigners, so I felt quite comfortable, because other foreigners were not a suspect. But I felt the atmosphere was very, very dry and quite cold in Geneva. Um, and I started to realize that the only way I could work was if I worked at night and slept in a day, because I had to share digs with four other girls. The, and the four other girls were all religious Jewish girls. It was strictly kosher. So I began to work at night because I felt either I'm talking and I'm sociable or I can work, I couldn't do both. And after half a year of that, I thought, maybe this is not so good for my health. And by chance, I met a young woman who said, you know, I am being treated at, the, uh, at Professor Mastro Paolo in his wonderful institution where they teach art therapy. And she said, maybe that's something for you. So I went there and I really liked it. And I got my mother to influence my father to allow me to study there. So I studied there for three years. And I read all these things. I made sculpture out of old bread and gloves and stones and things. And they even still have the collection there. So I love making things that seem inanimate and make them into something alive. And it gave me confidence because I realized also when I worked with patients, very soon I got to work with patients that maybe being free and imaginative and open without actually a lot of real knowledge. Mm. Just using your intuition um, worked pretty well. This is still from the first period of figurative work that said, where this is called embrace, very obvious. After my diploma, I already have met my husband, the musician and violinist Joseph Fröhlich, and I we decided we have to live in London, which suited me okay. It was a long way away from Luzern. <laughs> um, and there I started first, I, I suddenly felt strange enough, being in London, the three-dimensional was much more attractive than working in graphic art. I suddenly felt in front of a zinc plate or flat piece of paper, I didn't have the inspiration and I started again collecting things, started with clay, working in clay and soon enough had some exhibitions. We had children then and the topic was very often pregnancy, love, couples, 
Actually, funny enough, very often work like I am portraying what I haven't got yet. So when I wanted to have a child, I made these pregnant torsos in wood, in teak. Um, this piece, for instance, was called Tender Tension, which was again, you know, marriage. And I did a lot of pieces to do with relationships. I started with an obsession into flexibility. Because these guys, you see, they're still attached to each other, whether they like it or not. So I started to make this piece, which was called Transfigured Night. These figures have a personality of their own, but they really work well when they're together and when they do things together. And I was very interested to try and see that there's not one clear dominance in the relationship. There's a rapport, um, there's a rapport and they can also get cross with each other, but they can also do tender things. Especially because now I was married and I had children and I felt there was maybe this danger of being static, being cast in a particular role that you can't get out of. So for me this was always important, being able to have choices. These are actually sculptures that gave me some recognition because I had an exhibition at the Swiss Embassy where they featured this. So here you have the mother, which in my view is always got to be the most flexible character. This one can also stand on her back or on her head. So as in real life, you can see that women just have to be able to do anything. So the father gets supported and the baby gets supported by the mother standing on her head. Um, obviously you can see that I was very concerned about and interested in this fact. I had a husband who was forever traveling, he was always on tours, and that's when I made bigger things, dusty things, you know, you can't be very presentable if you were. I made a very large version, also which ended up in parks and gardens. Kids could actually carry it and they could sit and crawl under the dad, sit on the mother, and put the baby where they wanted, and I was very passionate about that. It's just that I'm commercially not very able, so I wasn't able to have this spread around the world in kindergartens, which is what I really would have wanted. I think I have a funny little version. I made this in very large, which is now in a school in Hampstead. It had a, a pulley here. This was called the giant jigsaw, except this one is a small version. And I made it sometimes as wedding presents. The important, of course, of the child, which was more and more a place. But you can also hide the child, become a unit again. Also from this time stems this. This is a model that the large piece of that is now standing in Lugano. This was still from this time where there was, you know, very tactile unity. And I did this actually when our children were that sort of age. Uh, this Sharon was, I think, four and Nadine six years older. No, they, they just carry colouring in a bit far. And this is the site we saw before we even lived here. I offered the town this sculpture. Rita, ich bin die Bildhauerin. Ach so. Ja, ja. Doch, doch, ich wohne in der Nähe und da habe ich das gerade gesehen. Und dann dachte ich, es kann jemand anders wird es wohl nicht putzen, muss ich schon selber machen. Das kann ich schon etwas Spanisch. Wer macht sowas schon? Ne? So, I, uh, du hast wissen, qualcuno mi mi ha fatto delle strisce con. Du sai chi era questo? Perché è una cosa stupida. Peccato. Eh? I was determined to make a dynamic sculpture, not the usual family where the kids are perhaps held. And I wanted to do it the other way around. And my mother was so fond of this piece too, and, um, because I made it still in London. When I brought it here, I was expecting it gives me contact with local architects here, which wasn't quite materializing. But we still enjoy it, and you can see kids enjoy it, and grandmothers enjoy it. Uh, and the transformation in bronze took place only a year ago when I decided to put it here in memory of my mother, who loved this piece.
I started making quite a lot of gardens on order for people and I loved the challenge. You know, you, somebody wanted um, two pieces somehow to bridge a gap and for me it was lovely as long as they left me free to do how I wanted to do it. This obsession with flexibility carried on a bit and then my father died. Um, I have by then made mainly things to do with love, the hood and tensions between people. So I stopped because I was lucky enough I could. Most of my sculptural colleagues couldn't afford to do that, but I stopped and studied chiatsu, which means mainly um, Chinese medicine and understanding more about energy and uh, understanding more about you know, things that are not visible. And I did continue working. I worked less and uh, maybe thought a bit more. You talked before about Shatsu, but how, how did it come? I mean, what did make you choose suddenly to do that? Mm -hmm. It wasn't a sort of decision from one day to the next. It started off by me feeling I had to do something meaningful where I was actually interacting with other people. And as I like tactile, interaction, I like touching, I like feeling things. I was looking around for a way to hopefully, you know, cure people or myself with a method that made sense. So I looked at anything from homeopathy and touch for health and foot massage. And I did first of all introductory courses in eight different subjects and suddenly I realized shiatsu is for me because it dealt with an understanding of an energy that you can only feel, you can't see it. It allowed me to really develop a different side of myself, which I thought was dormant. So it was three years, it was quite a hard slog. Um, because you also had to study, of course, pathology and anatomy. But I could feel I was good at it. I could feel you had time to tune in. And suddenly I had people under my hands. And you, you have hands of the sculpture. And so I could feel yeah, things. Yeah, yeah. I could feel things. And um, it was quite a revelation. You can also heal bits of yourself with it. And with it came doing Tai Chi. just looking at the series which I kept rather quiet and only showed once in public before leaving London. I called it Visions of Ourselves. There were pieces which showed more some problems in life, public and private problems. As for example here this is a piece about the menopause which is something we all face sooner or later where really we still feel beautiful like you will have seen in the mirror. So the woman still feels like she was when she was young, but she has to face the fact that things will not be quite the same. The grass is greener, but it was also called Don't Brick Up My Rainbow, because I, I realized that the world is very much what we believe it to be and what we want it to be. It's not always the reality. You just see, you know, this hand, which is my hand, reaching up for this ominous apple, which is the truth. And this is the tree of life. It was actually called the tree of life. I always felt that it was good that Adam had a bite of this apple that gave him a knowledge of good and evil and all the bits in between. But underneath here, it's also 